Today's passage comes from Jeremiah 1, verse 4 to 19, from the English Standard Version. Jeremiah 1, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. The word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, disasters shall be let loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they shall come, and every one shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against all its walls, all around, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will declare my judgments against them, for all their evil in forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. But you, dress yourself for work. Arise and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls, against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. This is the word of the Lord. Let us respond with thanksgiving, saying, Thanks be to God. We are continuing our series today. We're looking at the life of Jeremiah. And we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 1, as you know. Um, before we get to the sermon, once again, uh, let's just say a word of prayer. Let's ask God for help. God, we thank you that we have your word, the same word that your believers have had for millennia. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that in these two things, in your word and in your spirit, that today we have everything that we need. So God, would you minister to us? Would you fill us up? Would you satisfy the thirst and the hungers in our lives? Would you heal us where we need healing? Would you enlighten us where we need to see? We ask for your ministry and your work to be done. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. When God calls Jeremiah, um, he calls him in a very unique way. So when we look at the calling of Moses, for instance, we know that God almost immediately calls him into a mission and a task, right? Go and free Israel from the the bondage and oppression of, of Egypt. Um, same with uh, Gideon, right? He almost immediately calls him to a task, like go fight, go fight the, the Midian army. When God calls Jeremiah, he begins by telling him that he knew Jeremiah before he was ever in his mother's womb. A very different way of calling him, right? Before Jeremiah was born, God continues to say like he was consecrated. God had set him apart and appointed him as a prophet. And there are two implications here. Uh, first, before Jeremiah ever had a chance to show God that he had the right resume for the calling, God chose him, right? Before Jeremiah ever showed whether he was a success or a failure, God chose him. So that's not the criteria of God's calling of Jeremiah, right? 
there's a sense of like Jeremiah didn't earn this calling. This was God's choosing and God's preparation. But secondly, and more importantly, Jeremiah's calling is firmly anchored in God's purposes. We get a sense that there's just a strong, firm purpose of God into which Jeremiah is called. And this is not destiny. Please don't confuse this with destiny. Um, Destiny is where like Jeremiah would have no choice in the matter and um, he's following a predetermined path like a robot. That's not not what this is. Uh, That kind of idea of destiny, that's a pagan notion and that's not what this is. Jeremiah still has to respond to the call of God. He can still resist the call of God, and, and which he does in this passage. So it's not destiny here. But there is an overwhelming sense of God's strong calling on Jeremiah because God has been preparing him since even before he was born. Now, why would God's call to Jeremiah expi- explicitly begin this way? even though implicitly applies to probably all believers because Paul picks this up in Galatians that he, before he was born or before he was in his mother's womb, he was called into the ministry. But explicitly God says this and begins this calling with Jeremiah, but he, be, he doesn't say this to anybody else called in the scriptures. It's because Jeremiah's message is going to be rejected. He is going to be rejected as a prophet. He won't see one person, not even one person, come to faith during his lifetime. He won't see any fruit from his ministry. He'll just basically be ignored. He has all these things of God to speak, all these words from God himself to speak, and no one is listening. When we face invalidation and discouragement from, the, from everyone around us, that's, that's powerful, right? When all the people that are our friends or our family invalidate us or discourage us, that's, that's quite powerful. And we don't get through something like that by sheer willpower or by our titanic strength. There was a social experiment uh, they once did where they placed 20 people in a room. And 19 people are in on the experiment and there's one person that's not. So when this one person who's not part of the experiment gets into that room with the the 19 other people, there's 20 people in total, but the 19 people will begin to say, no, there's 19 people in this room. And it was interesting because in a matter of minutes, that one person who's not a part of the experiment would cave to the other 19 people and say, oh, no, you're right. Um, There's not 20 people in this room, there's 19, right? Two people could last a bit longer before they caved, And three people could resist indefinitely. Think about this for a second. That was just a room. That was just one person in a room with 19 people. Jeremiah will be one man against the whole nation telling him he's wrong and God has not spoken to him and God is not with him. Don't we also face this kind of discouragement? You know, isn't there moments in our lives as well where we feel like the voices, whether it's our own voices or other voices are, are telling us, God's not with you. God's not speaking to you. You're wrong. And that's why Jeremiah, that's why God starts with Jeremiah this way. That I, before you were even in your mother's womb, I was preparing you for this calling. Because he will need this kind of strong conviction when all the voices around him will tell him you're wrong. He will need the strong conviction to help him stay on course and follow God, even if no one else will follow follow God. This was a great calling on Jeremiah. You know, God called him before he was born and he would be a prophet to the nations. Note that. Like, it's not just being a prophet to Judah. It's being a prophet to the nations. A very great calling. And the calling is actually so great that Jeremiah doesn't think he can do it. So we read in verse 6, Jeremiah says, I don't know how to speak, for I am only a youth. Jeremiah feels inadequate in two ways. First, prophets are people who speak. And Jeremiah says, I don't know what to say. Second, Jeremiah says, I'm only a teenager. What can I do? 
And like Moses, God addresses these concerns. Jeremiah won't have to worry about what to say. God says he will command him. He will command him what to speak. God will actually touch Jeremiah's mouth, and that's very reminiscent of Isaiah, right? When Isaiah had that vision and God took the burning coal and touched his lips and put, God put his words in, in Isaiah's mouth. It's very reminiscent of that, that God is putting, he actually touches Jeremiah's mouth and puts his words in Jeremiah's mouth. So that's not a problem. God says, I'll give you what to speak. You don't have to know what to speak. As a teen, uh, Jeremiah wasn't in a political office. It wasn't, it wasn't common for teens to be in political office. That was the roles that usually an elder would be in. Teens in that culture didn't have influence. They weren't the movers and shakers of the world. The voices of teens, I think kind of like today, they were largely ignored, right? They didn't have credibility with rulers of nations. And in verse, verse 7 to 10, God, once again, he answers these concerns about Jeremiah being a teen and being just a nobody. God tells Jeremiah not to say that you're just a youth. God will direct Jeremiah. God will be with Jeremiah to deliver him so he doesn't have to be afraid, right? A little bit ominous there. Like, why, does, why would he have reason to be afraid? It's a bit of an ominous warning. But anyway, God tells Jeremiah that he has set him over nations and kingdoms. Now, these two concerns of Jeremiah that he considers his weakness to the calling, right? These two reasons, these two objections that he thinks are the reasons why I can't fulfill the calling of being a prophet. You want to see something amazing? This is exactly what God needs in a prophet, right? So that's why this is a little bit different than Moses. Moses, God calls him and he says, in spite of your weaknesses, I'm sufficient enough. Gideon and Israel, when God calls them, he, call, he necessarily has to call them in their weakness so that they, they don't get prideful and think that they've saved themselves. Right? In this situation, Jeremiah's weaknesses is exactly what God is looking for in a prophet. Because what is a true prophet? The true prophet only speaks the word of God. If a so-called prophet speaks anything other than the words of God, he's a false prophet. God needs someone who doesn't know what to say so God can give him the words to speak. The true prophet doesn't accomplish God's calling by his strength or power, by their own ability. It's through God's presence and power that the prophet accomplishes the mission so to claim to be a prophet right to claim to be a prophet of god and then to go out and to do things in your own ability in your own strength with your own skills and then put god's name on that that's blasphemy the bible defines that as blasphemy that's a false prophet that's why God calls a teenager who has no social influence, who has no political office, and who can only rely on God, who has to rely on God. But notice this too. But when God speaks to this teenager, there's going to be global impact, right? God says nations and kingdoms will be destroyed and overthrown or built up and planted. And what we see here is like God's call, Jeremiah's weakness, and God's sufficiency are like puzzle pieces that fit exactly perfectly together. You know, I've seen with my own eyes what can happen when young people are not written off because of their age or because they're just students, their place in life, and people believe in what God can do in them. I mentioned a passion conference before. You know, it's a gathering of Christian college and university students aged uh, 18 to 25 years old. And I've been to, I think I've been to like four of these conferences. But um, the first one, 
um, th- at these conferences, they always have like a tie between worship and missions, right? We worship the greatness of God. We, we get to know God and how, how awesome He is. And then we want other people to know Him. So there's a tie between worship, knowing the worthiness of God, and then wanting other people to know that as well, right? So at every one of these passion conferences, there's a tie, be- there's, a, there's a missions cause, right? I remember the first one in 2011 that I went to, there was 22,000 students. And they were, we were being asked to raise uh, 500,000 during the conference. And in that, at that conference, the students raised $1.1 million for that cause. But the one that I will never forget, like the one that I will really never forget, it's going to Passion in 2017, where 50,000 students in the old Georgia Dome that's not torn down were being asked to sponsor every Compassion uh, Canada, or sorry, not Compassion Canada, every Compassion child in the country of El Salvador. And quickly, like, my mind started to spin, and I'm like, okay, it's one thing to ask college, like, poor college and university students to sponsor, I mean, to give a one time lump sum, like, to give $20 or to give $40 or $50. But it's something quite different to ask poor college and university students to give $35 US, by the way, every month to sponsor a compassion child. And I didn't think the students at the conference would reach that goal. You know? And I'm, I'm humbled to say that I completely wrote them off. And I completely wrote off God, what God could do. I thought, yeah, God's not going to do it through these poor, immature, inexperienced students. On the last day of the conference, the leader of the conference announced that the students had sponsored all the compassion children in El Salvador, Indonesia, Rwanda, Tanzania, and 900 in Bolivia. And I remember just hearing the voice of God in my heart at that moment. I felt so humbled in that moment. And God just saying to me, see, you wrote off these students just because of their age, just because of their place in life, just because of their social economic status. You wrote them off and you wrote me what I could do through them. You know, that when I get in the midst of these students, you can you see what I can do. And just to tie this in with Jeremiah, um, with Jeremiah going before rulers of nations. The global impact that these students were having around the world, you know, when they're, as they're going to these to Passion Conference and they're, they're partnering with different organizations, making a global impact on the world, you know, you know who um, they got the attention of? The U.S. president at the time, Barack Obama, started paying attention to this. I don't know what your weaknesses are today, or what you're being told about your weaknesses. But I just want to encourage you not to listen to the narrative that you are written off because of your weaknesses. We believe in a God. We have a God who can perfectly match weakness, calling, and His sufficiency. Then God goes on to give Jeremiah two visions. The word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah, and then God asks him what he sees. In the first vision, Jeremiah says he sees an almond branch. And then God affirms that Jeremiah has seen correctly and and explains that he is watching over his word to perform it. And there's a play on words here in Hebrew because the word for almond is shaked. And the word for watching is shokhead, and it's basically a pun. So there's this old joke that I want to share with you guys to help you guys understand what's, like, what's how these words are functioning here. There's this old joke that I know where um, the joke goes like this. What did the sushi say to the bee? Some of you may know the answer to this. The answer is wasabi, right? Wasabi is the green stuff that we put in our soya sauce to eat with sushi. But it's also a pun because wasabi sounds like what phrase? What's up, B, right? And that's the same way that, that these words are functioning here. When God gave 
Jeremiah this vision and he says, what do you see? And he says, shaked. What he would have heard at the same time is, oh, that sounds like shoked. So not only does he see a almond branch, he sees a watching branch. And the reason God gave Jeremiah the specific image is that he wants Jeremiah to know that God is watching. He's watching over his words. He will be the one to fulfill it. In essence, God is uh, telling Jeremiah that God is true to his word. Jeremiah just, Jeremiah just, he just needs to speak. Like the words I give you, Jeremiah, just speak. My responsibility is to make sure they're fulfilled but they are going to be fulfilled. So why is this the first vision and first word that God gives to Jeremiah? And why is there in this calling of Jeremiah, why is there two visions that he gives? Because with this first vision, what God is doing is he's building a relationship of trust with Jeremiah. God wants Jeremiah to know that he can depend upon him And not only that, but he has to depend upon him because God is going to be the one to fulfill his word. See, the Christian life of following and obeying God, it can only be accomplished in dependence on God. And this will become more clear in the second vision. So let's go to the second vision now. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah again, and this time he sees a boiling pot And it's facing away from the north, which means it's tilting toward the south. And God says explicitly that disaster is coming to Judah from the north. Before we go on with God's explanation, um, notice that this time at the end of, of the vision, God says things like, don't be dismayed. And I will make you a fortified city. And they will fight against you, but they will not prevail. Uh, Sounds very ominous. Why is he saying these things at the end of a vision? It's because unlike the first vision, this vision is dangerous. To say these words, it's dangerous. To say these words, this is risky. Because the leaders in Judah at that time, including King Josiah, they were thinking different. They were thinking different than God. See, the historical situation that Judah was in was that north of them was Assyria, right? The Assyrian Empire. And they had already invaded Israel. There was, there were the, Israel was split into two countries, uh, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Assyria had invaded uh, Israel already and were brutalizing the people, God's people in Israel. Babylon was also in the north, and they were rising up. They were not a superpower yet, but they were definitely rising up, and they were a threat, right? They were a threat to Assyria. In the south, in the south, there was Egypt below Judah, and Egypt has, is seeing Babylon rising up, and they see them as a threat to them. So they want to go and help Assyria defeat Babylon and crush them. What Judah wants right now is to stop Egypt from helping Assyria. They want Babylon to crush Assyria so that God's people are no longer being tortured and brutalized. So they want to stop. They think the priority right now is stop Egypt from helping Assyria to get God's people out of this bad situation. It makes makes perfect sense, right? Like, the Assyria is the immediate problem. Assyria is the immediate source of pain. So let's, let's get rid of that immediate source of pain, and then we'll deal with things after, right? So this makes sense. It's, it's sensible. It's logical. It's, it's a no-brainer. And if you can't follow everything I've just said, just know this, that God is saying a threat is coming from the north. King Josiah and the, the leaders of Judah, they're saying, no, the threat is in the south. It's Egypt that we need to stop from helping Assyria. So when Jeremiah speaks these words, and he says it throughout the, the, book of Jeremiah, uh, the book of Jeremiah, that the threat is from the north. He keeps repeating God's words given to him that the threat is from the north, not the south. Look to the north, not the south. 
but no one's listening to him. They probably would have laughed at him. They probably would have criticized him. And they probably would have assassinated his character because of these words. That's why God at the end of this vision says, don't be dismayed. See, from a geopolitical standpoint, what Jeremiah was saying was nonsense. But if you know even general biblical history, you know what's coming next. So King Josiah takes Judah and he goes to fight Egypt in the south, thinking that the threat is in the south. He goes to that battle. He dies in that battle. And then from that point on, it's just a matter of time before exile comes to Judah. See, King Josiah, and don't think that King Josiah was a bad king. He wasn't. King Josiah was a good king. It's under King Josiah's leadership that Judah rediscovered the Bible, the scriptures, right? It's under King Josiah's leadership that they began taking down the idols in Judah. They were on the cusp. They were possibly on the cusp of a revival as they were taking, as these reforms were kicking in and as they're They were coming under obedience to God's word. But the one mistake that he made was that he looked at his situation not by God's word. He was only looking at it geopolitically. He was looking at it by his own thinking. He was looking at it practically. And when he died on that battlefield, hope for revival died with him, basically. Evil kings would rise up after him. And then Judah will go into exile. And this is the point is that when we don't live in dependence on God, but by our own thinking and views, what seems practical, sensible, and sound today can be destructive tomorrow. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm not saying that faith is always nonsensical and illogical. That's actually very dangerous too, right? That's dangerous too. What I'm highlighting for us today, are we living in dependence upon God so that we can see our life situation properly and clearly and rightly? And there's more to this. When we read God's explanation of the vision of the boiling pot, we also notice a contrast in how the leaders in Judah were thinking and what God says. The leaders were only looking at their circumstances geopolitically, and, but God made it clear that what would happen was not just geopolitical. If we read the, the vision, God says, this is spiritual. This is not only a geopolitical issue, this is a spiritual issue. When the nations invade from the north, this is going to be God's judgment for Judah's idolatry. And in the book of Jeremiah, once again, this is something we read over and over again. But you know what the leaders are saying? And this is so twisted, but and might be so clear to us, but wasn't so clear to them at the time. The leaders and people of Israel refused to believe disaster would come. Like, I want to encourage you, please read the book of Jeremiah. It's just so interesting. Even though there was idolatry, Judah was still fulfilling all the religious requirements in the temple. And as long as the temple stood and religious activity continued, they didn't believe there was a spiritual problem. Even though idolatry was everywhere. And that's just the point. When we are seeing life only through our thinking and our eyes, we never see life rightly. Jeremiah was able to see life correctly, affirmed by God, because he was dependent upon God. So what does it look like to be dependent upon God today? just want to share a story that I think is really profound, especially for our young people who are teenagers or who are students in college and university. Um, just want to share that, really share this with you. 
Uh, pastor Charles Price, who's, uh, who was the former senior pastor of the People's Church and a pastor who's now retired, but someone who I, I enjoy listening to his sermons, he shared this, um, this story, which I think is a, a, a perfect illustration, a very simple illustration, but a perfect illustration of what it means to live in dependence upon God. So like some of you maybe um, who are graduating, uh, Charles Price had graduated from Bible college. And after, he was wondering, what do, I, what do I do with my life? I know that I want to be in some form of Christian ministry, but I'm not sure what to do exactly. There were six opportunities that were open to him at the time that he could pursue. But he didn't know which one of them to take. So he went to go meet with someone who he considered very wise. And this wise man said to him, or he asked this wise man, uh, which one of these six opportunities should I take? And this wise man in his wisdom told him, none of them. And then he said, well, what should I do then? And he said, what you really need is a vision for your life from God. And I think that's just so wise, you know. So he went away for two, two days at a, a conference center just to spend time in God's word and to pray. And as he was there at this conference center, God kind of impressed upon him Psalm 37, 4, this delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, right? And please don't read this the wrong way. Delighting in the Lord doesn't mean that now you'll get every earthly thing you ever want in your life. Delight yourself in the Lord means that if you delight yourself in the Lord, the desire of your heart will be God. God will be given to your heart. So he took that passage. He allowed, he received that passage from God and he began to write down, like if, if all the options were open to him, if he could write his own ticket, what would he want? How would he want to delight in God? So he began to list, list these things. And after the two days, he turned down all six opportunities. And he said he felt like an enormous freedom come over him. There was an enormous freedom to pursue what God really wanted for his life. And for you young people, like I want to encourage you to do the same thing. As you're graduating or as you're studying, do this early in your life. Don't wait long. Do this early, but ask God, give me a vision for my life from you. You know, maybe, maybe like Pastor Charles Price, you need to go away and just spend time in prayer and with his word. But I want to encourage you, do that for your life. Anyway, so he had this list of things that he, he desired for God to lead him in, in terms of, of what to do with his life. But he, this is another wise thing that he did as well that I want to share with you as well. When God does give you a vision for your life, don't go, don't go out and, and tell everybody, right? Just keep it to yourself. Just keep it to yourself, you know? Why? Because you want God, you want to give God opportunities. Even if you know that God spoke to you, you want to give God opportunities to confirm that. So, he didn't go out telling people, oh, I, I have this amazing, God spoke to me, I have this amazing list of things that, um, about what I want to do with my life that God gave me. He didn't say all that. He just kept it to himself. One day he was called in to meet with Major Ian Thomas, the founder of Cape and Ray uh, Bible School. And they began to talk. And he said, Charles, uh, Charles what are you doing these days? And he said, oh, not much. I don't know what to do. He said, uh, do you want to work here? And he said, what do you have in mind? And as they began to talk, Major Ian Thomas began to list all of the things that were on his list. And he said, in that conversation, he also said, the job description, yeah, you're not going to have to write that down because it's only two words. Preach Christ. That was the job description. And he said, we're not going to have to write that down. There's only two words. They're really simple. God's going to give you opportunities. Just preach Christ. And then he said, uh, and about your salary, yeah, we're not, we're not going to have to write that down either because there is none. 
we have no money. But he said, if you are in the right place, doing the right things, God will supply the resources. And Pastor Charles Price would spend the next 26 years working at Cape and Ray under those terms. Living in dependence on God is the only way that the Christian life can be lived. What is that? What do we see in today's passage in the life of Jeremiah? It's being planted in God's word, right? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Now the canon, like it's, the canon is closed today, so it may not come that way to us today. But we have the Bible. We need to be planted in God's word. And secondly, we need to be building up a relationship of trust with God. That's what God did, right? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. A relationship of trust was being built between God and Jeremiah. And therefore, he obeyed even when it was difficult. He obeyed even when it would put his life at risk. Even He obeyed even when people were assassinating his character. He obeyed when every, even when everyone else was telling him he's wrong. He hadn't heard from God. We need both of those things to see life clearly and to follow and obey. We can't just be in God's word. I know that uh, the word, believe me, I value the Bible and I value the word of God, but you cannot only be in God's word without being in a relationship of trust. Why? Because when things get difficult, and when God says something that you don't want to hear, you're going to turn away. I recently heard a pastor give an example of this. He was, his father was ill, and he was far away from where his father lived. And he just desperately wanted to leave the ministry that he was in to go and, and be with his old father. And he, he was just crying out to God, saying, God, please let me leave. Let me leave this ministry and go to my ailing father. The next morning, he opened up his Bible, and right there where he was in his Bible reading, it said, let the dead bury the dead, but you come and follow me. Not today. You're not going today. A year later, another pivotal moment, he's, he's just pleading with God, please let me go back to my father. Let me go back to my sick father. He's at a restaurant with his wife. The waitress, who happens to be a Christian, doesn't know anything about that verse, doesn't know anything about his situation. She says, I uh, just wanted to, I don't know you, but I'm a Christian, and I just felt like God was putting this verse on my heart. Let the dead bury the dead, but you come and follow me. Not today. Not today. We cannot just be in God's word. We cannot just be like, oh, God's word is just interesting. Is there a relationship being built with God? A relationship of trust that even if God says things that you don't like, you're willing to trust him and follow him and obey him. And it also can't just be relational without God's word, without the Bible. Why? Because God's the Bible, God's word, teaches us who God is and also who he isn't, which is important, and how he desires to relate to us. Without the Bible, you can't really know if you're in relationship with the true living God or if you're in a relationship with an idol of your own making. That doesn't work either. We need both. We need to be planted in God's word and also be developing a relationship of trust with God. That's what it is to live in dependence upon God. And God said to, at the end, God says, like, as God is putting Jeremiah in this relationship of, of dependence and trust and being planted in God's word, and he, Jeremiah is living by God's word, not his own thinking, he is able to follow and, and obey and God reassures him 
Because of his dependence upon God, God reassures him what? No, none will prevail against you, for he is with us. Centuries later, the Apostle Paul will say it like this in Romans 8.31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let me say it like this. If God is for us, who or what can be against us? Let's take a moment now to reflect on God's word, God's word read, and God's word preached. What is, what is something that God may be stirring in your heart today? Let's take a moment to reflect, and then we'll enter into a time of confession. God, we want to just confess today because we know that you are a God who can forgive us and cleanse us and renew us. So we can come with honest confessions today, not feel like we're going to be condemned. That's just the beauty of who you are. That when we admit our guilt, we don't receive condemnation. We, see, we receive mercy and life and renewal. God, we want to confess today for where we have written people off because of their weaknesses, where we have criticized people, where we have allowed their weaknesses to overshadow you. And we basically said, you're basically telling you, God, you can't do anything here. We doubt you. We doubt your greatness. We doubt how big you are. We doubt your sufficiency because of the weaknesses that we see in people. So God, would you forgive us if we have written anybody off, any person off because of their weaknesses, Lord. We ask for forgiveness for that. Give us a change in our attitude. Help us to see people with eyes of faith. Help us to see people as you see them. Help us to see in every situation how great you are. God, we confess, Lord, if we've not been living our life depending upon you, Lord. If we have been living blind, thinking that we understand and we know what to do in our life situation when by our own thinking, by our own view, by what we see, when in reality, you're calling us to live in dependence upon you. That that's the only way the Christian life can be lived. That's the only way we understand our lives properly. God, forgive us, Lord. Bring us back into relationship with you. Bring us back into a relationship of trust with you. Bring us back to your word. Help us to live in dependence, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your words of scripture to us. Your words of rec reconciliation. That now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are free. We can be free. We can be new people today. We thank you for the cross. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.